Our instructor for this session is Dr. Robert Morey. Dr. Morey is a graduate of Westminster Theological Seminary, where he received both the Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry degrees. He is the author of books on a wide range of subjects, including the masterfully written Death and the Afterlife, as well as When Is It Right to Fight? and How to Keep Your Faith While in College and a number of other titles for both popular and scholarly audiences. Dr. Morey is director of the Research and Education Foundation of Austin, Texas, and he's been a behind-the-scenes researcher, colleague, and encourager to the John Ankerberg Show staff for a number of years. He's a tender-hearted and compassionate pastor and a challenging teacher. Dr. Morey's topic for this session is The Doctrinal Errors of the Church of Christ concerning baptism and its relationship to salvation. This is part one. As you listen to this information, it'll be my prayer that God will increase your faith and draw you closer to our Lord. Our Father, we do thank you for the fact that you have not left us in confusion and ignorance concerning what to believe concerning you, what to believe concerning salvation, and even the relationship between baptism and salvation is given us in your word. We do bind the powers of darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his authority, by his power. We ask now for the filling of the Holy Spirit, that he will guide us into the truth, for we seek to honor you and your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles with you this morning. I do not suggest that you should go into the world of the cults and the occult unarmed. The Word is our sword. It is the means by which we not only defend ourselves, but we go on to conquer the very gates of hell itself. In St. Matthew's Gospel, in his synopsis of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Jesus begins in verse 15 by saying, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Now, this chapter is interesting because verse 1 is a passage that has been quoted by nearly every unbeliever in the United States and used as a club to uh, hit the child of God upon the head. I can think of a num numerous times that my own relatives have told me after I pleaded with them to turn to Christ, judge not lest ye be judged. And they just feel that that verse means no Christian has a right to feel that anyone is not saved. And here, if you have some relative who's gotten pregnant out of wedlock, and you say that is fornication, they say, I'll judge not lest you be judged. Or you've got homosexuals, and you've got this, and you've got that. And the moment the Christian tries to say something, immediately the unbeliever, the only verse they know in the Bible is this one, judge not lest you be judged. And then they just think, we've got you. We've got you. We're quoting the Bible. But you will notice from verse 5 that Jesus was not addressing his disciples he said, you, and what is the next word? Hypocrite. He is referring to those who give a public judgment against sins that they are secretly participating in. So if I were involved in adultery, for me to stand up and say, so-and-so is an adultery, and I condemn it, I'm a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing the other. So Jesus here, addressing the hypocrites in the crowd, warned them that this kind of judgment, when you complain about the speck that is in someone's eye, when you have a log out of your own eye, is hypocrisy. Then he began to address his people once again, and there he tells them to indeed to judge men and women. There are some people we must judge as being pigs, wild pigs. You do not cast your pearls, gospel pearls, before them. There are those who must be judged as being dogs. Now, this doesn't mean the friendly little puppies, Fifi and Fufu that you have at home, or some of you manly men, you may have King or Fang. 
There are two different Greek words for dog. This is the one for wild, savage dog. These are the, the dogs that roam the street, that attack children and get into the garbage. He not only said that Christians have a right to say, that person is a dog. That person is a pig. I'm not going to give that which is holy. I'm not even going to bother with that person because they will not listen. There are some people you don't have to witness to. You can write them off with Christ's approval. He also said that Christians should be able to discern, to identify, and to judge people as being false prophets in order to say to someone, you are a false prophet or you are following a false prophet. And he said you will know them by their fruits. One of the most interesting observations that we can make in our introduction to this whole section dealing with the Church of Christ, the Christian Church, the disciples of Christ, and since we'll be dealing with their particular aberration on baptism, it's the same theology that you will find in the Mormon Church, in the United Pentecostals, and other groups. So we're actually dealing with a, at least a dozen cultic groups in our session on Church of Christ. Same arguments they give, and the answers we give are the same ones that work with every one of them is to point out that the major cultic societies that plague us today all began in the 19th century. Indeed, I have observed in some of my writings that the 19th century is the spawning ground of the cults. If you want to trace the history of the various Mormon denominations, be it the Latter-day Saints or the reorganized or the disorganized or whatever they are, you trace them back, back, and you're immediately in the 1800s. You want to trace the origins of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? Back to the 1800s. You want to trace the origin, the genesis of the Seventh-day Adventists? Back to the 1800s. You want to deal with Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian Scientists? Back to the 1800s. Matter of fact, all of the major cultic groups that exist as parasites feeding off the Church of Jesus Christ all spawned in the 19th century. And as you examine the theology, be it the Christadelphians or whatever they are, you begin to find certain common doctrines, certain things they hold together. These were men and women who lived at the same time in history. Did you know they even talked about each other? Joseph Smith referred to William Miller as Father Miller. Remember the man who set a date for Christ's return in 1843 in October? And you see, these people knew of each other and they shared various theories, but when you begin to go up that stream, if you're looking up a salmon stream and you're going back to the spawning ground, you end up with what is called the Restoration Movement. Well, what was the Restoration Movement? It was a religious movement created by none other than Alexander Campbell, his father, Thomas Campbell, and then various other individuals such as Barton Stone and Walter Scott and others. And this religious movement, which not only ultimately created the Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church, and other uh, different splinter groups, it all 